www.avaforex.tv An exclusive conversation with America's most trusted... You want to be really when others are fearful and you want to be fearful. That's the way I win Grand Slams. I think everyone... An amazing collection of interviews. You now can watch Charlie Rose around the globe weeknights on Bloomberg Television. You're back uh, with the countdown on Bloomberg. My name's Rashad Salamat. Uh, just uh, taking a look now at what happened 10 years ago because uh, the Nasdaq peaked. It ended an era of fast, uh, of fast money built on internet hype. The gold rush into cyberspace kicked off in the US, but here in Europe, many surfed the internet wave as well. A decade later, what is left? And have investors learned anything as we emerge from another burst bubble? Simon Demokan reports. Dan Wagner is one of the few who managed to turn the dot-com crash to his advantage. In 2000, he bought the assets of Boo.com, one of the biggest failures of the internet boom, for just $250,000. The British site selling fashion online had used up almost $200 million in a year and a half before the dream turned into a nightmare. Today, Wagner's company, Vendor, has become one of the leading e-commerce providers. One billion dollars of retail sales went through its platform last year. What happened at that time was such euphoria and enthusiasm about this potential um, market opportunity of the internet that investors backed whatever was going. And to some degree, there was an element of, we don't really know how to monetize this market, we don't know how to create value, let's back everything going and something will come up trumps. Many technology companies did not come up trumps. The dot-com crash wiped out $5 trillion in market value in two and a half years. In Europe, Boo.com was just one of the losers. Other big failures include Moonfruit, where people would create their own websites, or Click Mango, the online beauty retailer. Winners were mostly American giants, such as Google, eBay, and Amazon. Some made it through with a few scratches, like LastMinute.com, whose hot IPO coincided with the bursting of the bubble. Later, it was bought by Travelocity. Companies which were able to go through were those companies who tried to invest and develop technology around the Internet, rather than use the Internet as a service-based. The thing that they probably they learned is that the customers needs to be prepared and let's say educated in order to use a technology. As the internet evolved, newcomers, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter generated more buzz. It was the beginning of the beginning, yes, yeah, so and we're now, we're now still at the beginning, but it's a much more mature market and businesses are now really starting to see the potential. Potential that Wagner and others like him plan to exploit in the decade to come. Simon Demacan, Bloomberg News. Uh, just a bit of breaking news at the moment. Uh, just weeks away from a general election in the UK, Prime Minister Gordon Brown uh, delivering a key economic speech in London. He's uh, telling the country that there are still substantial risks, uh, risks ahead. Let's uh, hear what he's got to say. Fundamental questions, not just about established economic orthodoxies, but about the whole balance between the state markets and the institutions that regulate and govern them. And the decisions that we took were without precedent. When I first came into Parliament almost three decades ago, I never imagined that I would one day, with Alistair Darling, have to nationalise a major building society and put up £50 billion of public money to buy majority control of two of the world's biggest banks. Or that we would need to reverse decades of orthodoxy by restructuring the banking system and then have to agree a very substantial fiscal stimulus and programme of printing money to support a world economy that faced the unprecedented threat of a global credit freeze. And neither could I have imagined the huge step forward in global economic cooperation that for the first time brought together in a leader's economic summit, China, India, Brazil, South Africa and other emerging economies together with the G8 to repair a broken global financial system. But this last 18 months has not been a time for allowing the old conventional wisdom or short-term headlines to constrain our thinking. Alistair Darling and I have worked with our international partners to make the tough decisions that were necessary to give us a fighting chance. It's a period that has provided one of the greatest tests of character. And with hindsight, it is now clear how just how, how, just how close the world came to complete meltdown. In the space of just over six months, 
The equivalent of nearly four years of economic growth was wiped out as global trade plunged by 40%. And in 18 months, world stock markets fell by almost 50%. But this wasn't just about numbers. The human cost has been all too real, with millions of jobs lost around the world. During the recession, Alistair Darling and I have taken difficult decisions, decisions that have tested our resolve, but we have stuck to them and maintained a consistent course making it possible for the resourcefulness of the British people to pull us through. I said we would take action to restructure the banks, tackle unemployment, address the fear of repossessions, help small businesses with cash flow, and we did. And I said we would take action to reinvigorate the international economy and change the financial system, and we have. And so while we were hit with a great recession, we now know that the world has indeed avoided a great depression. And we avoided that depression not by accident, but by design, by learning from the mistakes made and experience gain 